you can either take the red pill, and you'll wake up, everything was a dream, or you can take the black pill, you can get torched. Well, I suppose getting torched won't hurt that much. I don't feel anything. Wait for it. Oh, wait. I just got a new client. Get torched! Get, get, get torched! Uh, get torched! I'm Wayne Carey, and this is The Truth Hurts. Well, The Truth Hurts, a special guest this week, Dark, a very special guest. In fact, he's come fresh from some big celebrations. He's, he's had a bit of a Midas touch, this man. He's come in with a bit of a swagger, none other than uh, Justin Lepic, Lepper. Hey, Dark, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I oh, know, it's been a bit of time in the making. I know, it was said about six months ago I'd come on. So yeah, The Truth Hurts, mate. So, <laughs> yeah. you know what? And it, and it does sometimes. Uh, so, you've, you know, you've, you've become... You, you swaggered in here. You're, you always had a bit of. You always had a bit of swagger. Mm. Um, actually, we'll go back because uh, we played a lot of our careers against one another. Yep. You started at the Bears when they were not so good, average. And and but you know what a what a career ended up being a three time premiership player and all that. But sort of take us back to when you played for the Bears and how tough it was to go to a club that uh, I guess, you know, was was really battling. It's funny, my daughter actually asked me that question this morning. We've got daughters the same age, both graduating um, about, first about now. Carey, hey, first carry ever to pass <laughs> year 12. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, my daughter that graduated last year, she got a 98.1, and I said to my wife, I said, we're going to have to check the uh, <laughs> DNA on this one. I don't know how that's happening, but... Um, Anyway, digressing. But she said to me, I said, what happened with your career? She asked me. And I said, well, I was actually at your age. I did year 12 in Queensland because she was asking where I graduated. Yeah. So that was – you got recruited a year younger. So I had my 17th birthday on the 1st of October and the draft was a few weeks later. So um, – and then flown up to Brisbane. I think the first contract back then was like 7500 bucks, And like you're, you're really thrown into the deep yeah. end. Um, so it was a difficult start. Uh, and then I did my knee about six weeks into the season. So – you're right. I'd never played against men before. Bunch of boys, you know, obviously had a good uh, junior career. And you're jumping up three, four, five levels straight to playing against men. So that was a, a massive challenge. And um, like any young key forward uh, or key defender, you, you're not really a good player until you get your body um, at a decent size. So, yeah, a tough few years early. And that was about the same time you started dominating was the time I was recruited. Uh, recruited so... He's still a few years ahead of me, mate, four or five maybe. Now, I know, Anton, uh, and you'll get into the nitty-gritty sort of stuff. He'll, he, he's the hard-hitting question, man. But see those shoulders aren't moving well, it, well I, just had a, I just had a shoulder replacement. Oh, did you? I did. How's it? Yeah, good? so I'm four weeks out. So uh, starting, to, yeah. starting to warm up to it. But So you defender, forward, you sort of flip-flop from one yeah. position to the other. How? What, what were you when you were a junior? You probably played midfield. I was a ruck. Yeah, I was, I was the tallest kid at 15 and mid-pack by about 16. Um, so I grew pretty large early. And so I was sort of that kick-behind-the-ball defender is what you did as a as a young ruck. So that's probably why defence ended up suiting me because that's where I ended up. Sort but forward was really, you know, I played it a little bit in the under-18s but just started doing it um, when I first started the AFL. But, um, but yeah, I, I probably didn't know where my position was because, as I said, I was a ruck pretty much my whole junior career and it took a while to work out what it was. So Leper, 96, Brisbane had a you know, decent run at finals but couldn't quite make the granny. It wasn't until much later you, you had the success there. What changed when someone like Lee Matthews walked in the door at that footy club in terms of you know, standards or the way you went about things? I think it's always a combination of things. It probably stems back to we were the first team also to get a lot of, um, I guess, early picks in the draft and uh, compensation picks and things like that. So the year I was re- recruited, Brisbane had picks two, four, and six. Imagine doing that nowadays. The, the competition <laughs> would lose their brain. And Sydney had one, three, and five. Um, so that's how much what they were... What year was that? That was 92 National Draft. Oh, so that, that's how much they were trying to look after those two clubs because how poorly they were they were going. So, um, yeah, and the night before the draft, I was Brisbane were coming around, and I was like, oh, Robert Walls is coming around. Oh, sorry. Scott Clayton's coming around. I opened the door. It's Robert Walls at 9.30 at night before the draft. And he said, well, we're taking you at pick four tomorrow. And I was like, oh, God. I was gutted a little <laughs> bit at the time. Um, but, yeah, and, and then that's how that started. But we, we went from Wallsy being the uh, – he's like the headmaster type coach. Um, so, you know, was, you know, 
with a stick whacking you sort of thing. Then we had John Northey and, and 96 is when John got there and going from Wolsey in 95, the headmaster coaching you, through to John Northey, which is like your granddad coaching you. I'll, I'll never forget the first one of the first nights I lived with Nathan Chapman and Trent Bartlett. And we lived in the same area in Kenmore. We went around to Swooper's house. He asked us around and we're just sitting there having a barbecue and he goes, he, he puts a VB in front of us. There was myself, the three boys. I'm like, okay. And no, we were halfway through the beer and he's put another one down. I'm thinking, holy shit. Had to get rid of the first one, start the next one. And then lo and behold, he's done it again. Trent Bailey's still got one and a half beers sitting there. He's like, I can't keep up. I'm pissed already. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the intro to Swooper. It was like that. It was like your granddad coaching you. So, um, which is a great breath of fresh air for the group. So I think that's what half of it was what started that kick start in 96. It's just that, that freedom um, going from one sort of headmaster coach to another, but it wasn't long standing. I think you need a balance of all of that. And I think Lee brought that when he eventually got there three years later. Well, you played in a preliminary final that year. That's right. We yeah. beat you in, in, yeah. the, in the prelim. Um, you had some obviously superstars in that team and it was the year after that you then can pick any Fitzroy player that you want. Because yep. remember the Fitzroy um, obviously folded and you have the choice of that. Is there any fear... And, and we spoke about this on my uh, podcast um, earlier in the week. Is there any, was there any trepidation with you guys that were already at the club knowing that they had a choice from anyone that they wanted at Fitzroy? Do you start worrying about your position? Um, yeah, well, we finished because we finished third that year and we're playing the last game of the year against Collingwood to finish on top of the ladder and we actually lost that game. Um, so we could have finished the top in 96 and that would have been a bit like an early premiership probably because we're a bit, bit too young and inexperienced. But Fitzroy were dead last by a fair bit. So I think most of us were thinking they're not taking our spot. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah, 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 we're probably enough. a bit ahead of ourselves a yeah. little. But um, there wasn't a lot of great talent to come out of that. Brad Boyd was the captain. He was, but he got injured for the most of the next two Chris seasons. Johnson. But we got Chris Johnson as a young player. Uh, Jared Malloy, who ended up being Mel Michael in a trade. Yeah. Um, but And then the rest sort of... You know, the, the, probably the next best one we got later was Pikey, Pikey yeah, yeah. Um, which was, you know, we could have got him at the start. We and groomed it, him. Yeah, you groomed <laughs> did, no, did you teach him all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I might have groomed him too well in a few areas. But, well, he, he was a great pickup, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. He was a, he's a sensational man. But the, the other one was Matthew Promise. He did, we didn't pick up. He was probably the next of the best of that, that, that three or four there. So um, we didn't get a heap out of that part of it. But... Um, it does help, though, doesn't it? You sometimes only need one or two players to help, you know, take you to that next level. You, you're known as a really uncompromising team in your successful years, but when did you start to to realise that you you had the you know a more special group? Because you mentioned you had the younger draft picks, but that doesn't always guarantee success. And then it felt like that Brisbane team was a was a was a was a bruising team, was a a competitive team. And and when did you sort of realise that that could play into your into your strengths as well? We, we probably played an era that it was still an, it gets playing against Wayne's team. So you, you probably remember the best teams of your era growing through. So the Kangaroos were part of that. It was the tail end of, I guess, West Coast um, in the early 90s as well. Carlton were up there for a bit. So we had a few, um, you know, counters against men, big men that um, used to bash around a few bit at that, that age. And we wanted to pass it on. And I think that that was really it. We knew once Duck shoulders started falling off, and you know the, you know Steve Kernahan's out of the game now, and all these guys are sort of you know by the wayside. It's like, hey, this is our turn now. We're we're the, we're through now. We're in our mid twenties. We're ready to go. We've had some hardships in finals, and 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 we're right to go. So I think whilst it wasn't said, and now we had got the coach as well to take us there. Um, I, I think there was a bit of an underlying belief there. It is a great example, and we've spoken about a lot over the weeks. If you if you go back through the history, and uh, there's been a lot said in recent times, Stephen May saying they were the best um, team. <laughs> and look, the best team doesn't always win. We mm. know 99 games led at Essendon. I think Essendon were the best team, 99, 2000, 2001. They got one flag out of that. Yeah. All right, you obviously beat them in 2001. I think they limped in a bit that year. You were, Like you said, you were primed, ready to go, and you knock off – this all powerful team that you know won in 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 two thousand. What do you? Where do you rate that team? And you look at Essendon, and everyone likes to rate, you know. And like you said, that that era we were strong. You obviously in the two thousands, Essendon right at the end and, and early two thousand. In my opinion, your team's the best team ever to play the game of AFL footy. 
I think that team would beat any other team ever to play, and that includes the Hawthorne of the 80s and it includes Carlton of 95 and Essendon of 2000. I just think because... Did he say North Melbourne in there? I don't think he... No. <laughs> and us. No, and us. That means I, I'd have to play on you. I do think... Well, we did uh, play yeah, on one, no, another, we... one, one game and uh, I kicked five and he kicked four. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a set-half back. <laughs> so... Oh, um, just playing my role. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so how do you rate that? How do you rate that team for one? And do you agree? Do you think, you know, you, you guys were the, uh, the, the best team? Yeah, I think pound for pound talent wise, yeah, we had, um, yeah, we had the best talent across the board. Like often when you do these teams and you match them all up, you know, you probably say we'd have fourteen positions and the other team might have eight. You know, they, you, you tend to do that when you're comparing the the teams overwards. So we just had a, a, yeah, a great depth of talent. We had a great DNA too. I, I, I still think it's probably the the era of footy where people enjoyed the fast pace of it too and the collision and the hits. It, it, it's sort of the game probably lost its way for about a 10 or 15 year period there it become really strategic and dour and and hopefully teams like the pies are changing that a little yep. bit and we're starting to see a little bit more free-flowing footy again too so um yeah who knows maybe if clark our coach eight years earlier he might have put the clamps on us and done other things and changed the game and made it harder for us but um i just think pound for pound um it was the i think the best team overall on paper that's for sure so what he's saying is do you get pissed off when when people say oh this team would this team would have beaten the brisbane of the early two is, is there a level of pride still there that thinks oh we, we would have we would have bashed these guys oh really because you've got to be old enough to remember like you think a 21 year old kid he doesn't know who i am yeah like you know i'll get but, you know, parents go, oh, I can't have a picture with Lepper, some little kid. I'm going, the poor kid's got no idea who I am. He's looking at me, he's looking at me in his face like, why? It's like, all for the parents. It's all for the parents. I said, yeah. I think this is for mum and dad, not for you. Don't yeah, worry about correct. it. And Because, and, yeah, because you've got to remember, you know, how we played and why we played. And a lot of people don't look back on history um, and watch old games anymore. Um, so, yeah. So guys our age can have that comparison. But guys at 30 years of age, I'd have no idea. So you finish your playing career, decorated, end up being a three-time premiership player, and then you decide that uh, you want to coach. <laughs> what were you thinking? I don't know if I wanted to. No. I actually had a year and a half of contract to go, and um, it was actually my daughter's first birthday, my eldest, who's now 19. And I woke up the next day at about 6 a.m. in the morning, and my back just completely spasmed. And I had this feeling down my leg. I just couldn't feel anything. And... Um, it was like I was lying in bed, was, and I said to my wife, I, said, I can't get up. And it was the strangest feeling. And I was thinking, oh, God, what's, what's this? So this is mid-year um, 2005. Um, up until that, I was feeling pretty good. I'd had back issues in the past, but um, cut a long story short, I'd actually done a lot of nerve damage, um, which affected my, my lower leg, my calf in particular, which still affects me today. But I couldn't really uh, – I ended up having the surgery about 12 weeks later, but I couldn't get back – um, playing again so about four games into the following year I tried to play um, and wasn't going that well um, the media would give me some good feedback on my uh, first few games and then Lee ended up dropping me and I, and I was thinking oh well this this is actually a bit more serious than I think because you can't see yourself play particularly when you've got an injury like that where it's more of a limp um, you don't feel the pain in it but it's just not working properly it was a strange injury to have and um, and then I thought, geez, when I spoke to the surgeon, he said, these things can take two or three years. And I was 30, bordering on 31. I'm thinking, well, what's it doing? 18 month rehab. Then I'm out of contract at 32. And it's all just, you know, so it came at me pretty hard. And he said, look, I want you to be a part of our coaching team. And I want, so realistically, that is how it happened at the end. I still thought I had two years of footy to go in my brain. Um, but it's sort of, as Lee said to me, he said, "Don't stress. You're just missing those years where all the people that used to beat you used to beat start beating you now." So he said, "You're not missing that much." So, um, but yes, yeah, so I was 30 at the time when it happened, so um, a little unexpected. So that's how I fell into coaching a little bit, um, and then it sort of grew from there. Well, you mentioned Lee, so uh, quickly clarify the, the famous or infamous <laughs> in story the lift story <laughs> about, the, about in the lift. <laughs> Run us through the story. And how, much, dollar for every how, much, how much truth is there? Uh... No, there's a bit of truth there. Mind you, Acker tried to claim it as his story at one point. Oh, of course but, he did. We're, but we're in a, we're in a lift. Jeez, Acker did well in the SAS uh, oh. thing. Oh. <laughs> 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 he's, he's, yeah, oh. What did you think? He was uh, so he's oh. got his payment. Obviously, that, yeah. he's got his payment, uh, and then he's well, yeah. Well, uh, 
What do I think? I thought it was very acker like. Yeah, well, yeah, well, a little bit was it. I, I actually missed it because all I got the messages. He was lasted like, half a day. I, I got the message through my old man. Oh. He goes, "Acker's on SAS." I sort of heard that, and then twenty minutes later, got a message. He's out already. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he, uh, he he said he hurt his foot. Yeah, but what he forgets is they had vision of him sprinting, sprinting <laughs> uh, at the end of one particular exercise that they had to do, yes. and they said, "Well, you weren't limping there." And then he comes back into the dorm and or the barracks, and they said, uh, "Well, you know, he, he had his boot off. There was no swelling, and he started limping around the joint." I'm, I'm going to have to give him up here because the boys were giving him a bit of stick in the players app, the old the old um, Brisbane Lions players app, because they had the reunion this year as well. <laughs> And uh, and everyone, everyone was started. Uh, was that gout last night, brother? <laughs> that was the start of it. Yeah. And it, that's Morton's new Roma, he said. So uh, Pricks missed that on the edits. Now everyone is saying I faked it. Happy to be out of there. But <laughs> so that's that was his. And he and then, and then he goes on like he and and Martin Pike, your mate, yeah. like, Blackie's still our number one reality TV star. So <laughs> yeah. this 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 thing keeps keeps going and. You get, and then he calls them pricks the way they looked after him. Anyway, it was worth the money. So you're on the path yeah, yeah. there with Acker. And then um, and then somehow he blamed me um, down the end of it because uh, uh, something I did. He goes, I did it because of Lewis Taylor's boots I wore when Leper was coaching the Lions and he made me do this commercial. So, oh, so it, 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 it became my fault from uh, boots he wore from Lewis Taylor eight years ago. Eight years so ago. there you go. Oh, <laughs> mate. He's a ripper. So yeah, go through. Sorry. Yeah, you almost got out of telling that story then. Oh, it was unreal. Um, sorry, where were we? No, yeah, Lee Matthews. Matthews. Lee Matthews. Oh, the lift, yeah. So, we, um, yeah, we're in the lift and um, – and Lee's actually quite a quick fellow. You work with him, but yeah. when you, you you throw a few little things at Lee, and he actually has his sort of underlying ego because you know no one ever says anything wrong to Lee Matthews yet. So um, yeah, we're in the lift and we're on the way up, and it was just dead silence for a second, which is quite weird. There was probably about ten or fifteen of us in this um, sort of commercial lift, and then I just said to him, um, "Lee, you'd be nothing without us." <laughs> and, and just I just. Is that right out there? <laughs> <laughs> Got a bit of a chuckle, a bit like now. Yeah. And he goes, mm, he does. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'd only be player of the century. <laughs> <laughs> So, and that got a bigger laugh, of course. Cause, yeah, um, yeah. But he was very quick like that. He's 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 very good at that stuff. Do you, do you still see much of Lee now? Was he at the reunion, yeah. for instance? And and uh, and how does that go with that group now? Because Akko is obviously part of that. Like this, these guys have you've all branched off in different directions. But how do you go when you when you meet your your teammates now, twenty years on? Uh, it's awesome, actually. Like we we've done it now a couple of years in a row. Because you know it's it's twenty year reunion now. It was nineteen last. I was 20 for the previous year and so on and so forth. So um, it's actually awesome. I find 20 years is a great um, – I don't know. It's, it's different. 10 years, some of us are still in the game. We're still competitive. We're still – in know, as you get there, this stage of your life, you know, it's, a, it's an era ago since you hung out with each other. Yeah. And I think you become closer and better friends in a way um, because you've all got different lives and different things and you go there to celebrate something you did that was awesome in your life and – um, not many people get to do that, and, and, and Pikey's actually one that's driven a lot of this, to be honest. So um, oh, he's awesome. That doesn't and, surprise and, me. <laughs> Pike could do anything. <laughs> the great, the great thing about that is, so when you have your twenty-five year one, you get three years in a row. That's right. Yeah, it's awesome. It is. The hard part is this year, Collingwood. I had to go from one party to the other yeah. for a little bit, which people said. I actually said to them, if you had of Collingwood had to start at more two thousand and you know four, five, six, that would have been helpful. Then I can go straight into Richmond yeah. at seven and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that would have been nice to do that, but um, but yeah, so it's uh, but yeah, good problem to have, but it's it's great catching up. Well, I think we're going to do it every year now. I don't think it's going to be just exclusive to the to the premierships because it's about the only time you get to catch up with your old mates again. So you obviously you you moved into coaching, which we've spoken about. You're at Brisbane initially, then you went to Richmond uh, at that stage. And so, what was the what was the, the outlook at the Tigers when you first went there versus second time? Well, the first time it was you know we're, we're we're there for a longer play. I don't think we won a game for the first nine games or something like that. Um, yeah, which is interesting. It was like, you know, everyone everyone was on the patience bandwagon. I think that was pretty big back then. Everyone, it was pretty in. I think we're a bit more impatient now as in um, 2023 than what we were in 2010. I think we're happy. Oh, our team's going to be poor for two or three years. It, it's sort of not a trend at the moment. Like, it's like, come on, Hawthorne, hurry up. You know, we're, there's a bit of hurry up in the, in the game nowadays. Everyone's trying to trade to get better quicker, so... Yeah, so that those things are always evolving, but the first three years were, um, yeah, really much on the build. I, th- I think we played finals the, the last year I was there in thirteen, 
Um, and the second time round was different because I just got sacked from the from the Lions and yeah. Dima was under the pump. He nearly got the boot as well. And there was a fair bit of urgency around winning. Um, so it was a very different uh, mechanic the second time round. And weren't you the forwards coach when you when when back? I first went back there? Yeah. So and then they invariably win the premiership. You've only got given because there's a lot of talk about how Richmond evolved their forward line, mm. and you only had one key forward up there. I mean, you had yeah. uh, Jack Rewald. I think Vickery might have been. Might he was out. Yeah, he was out. Only, yeah, it was only okay, Jack so, really. Yep. So. Oh, ben Griffiths actually got injured in the preseason and never played throughout the so year. So you've got so. one tall and then you've got all these small forwards, quick small forwards, mm. pressure forwards. Um, is it Was it more of just an evolution and, and you, you fell upon this game plan or or did you play a bigger role in that? Clearly you need the, – the one key forward, you need to be ultra competitive. Mm. Um, it was an interesting one. Um, when I was coaching the Lions the year before, one – one issue, which was many, don't worry, <laughs> and the list people that were going through it, a lot of kids, but didn't have any pressure in the front half of the ground. And it's it's one thing I wanted to create but couldn't do, mainly through personnel. Um, and I got to Richmond and I thought, hey, good's this? And I didn't know Dan Butler from a bar of soap. I didn't know Jason Castagna from a bar of soap. And we are out there training and, God, these guys can really – put pressure on and I, and I was always thinking well, this is the way we've got to go we've got to go one way or another you've got to keep the ball down there um so jack had to get him thinking hey you don't have to mark every ball first and foremost because if you bring it to ground will create create some a swarm of pressure and there is a there's a bit of ego with jack no. from <laughs> <laughs> so just how how do you have that conversation with a jack rewalt type player who's winning Coleman medals and and you've got to get him thinking more about that side of the game well it was easy you know what? Sometimes it's when you get someone in their career. I'll never forget having a meeting with Jack, and he may not remember this when I first got there. And he said, "Oh well, we're not saying we're stuffed now. He goes, we've got this young forward line. I'm just here for the future of these kids." And you know, it, it was almost like he's writing his obituary, you know, to me. And I said, "Mate, it doesn't have to be that way, you know." So he was at a time where he would have just would have done anything for team success. Um, clearly, he wouldn't have known we're going to win a flag twelve months later the way he was speaking at that point in time. But um, I just said to him, I said, Jack, you know what? If you just bring the ball to ground and lead these boys, I'll be happy. I'm not going to tell you how to play. You know how to play forward. I don't. Um, but lead them. And I said, and they're the two things I'll, I'll, I'll grudge, uh, judge you on, whether you compete in the air and whether you lead these boys well. Other than that, it's, it's all yours. It's your forward line and um, you drive it because you've got the experience and, and you have to empower the boys out there because you're not out. <laughs> we overrate what we can influence on game day. Your preparation – how you can influence on a coach is actually done in December and January and February and what you've set them up to do and set them up to be leaders and then and then you can add your little spices over the top. But um, it's very hard to to run the game from a coach's box, particularly nowadays when there's runner with limited rotations and you, you just can't do it. The other one that uh, changed his game a fair bit was Trent Cotchin. Um, mm. You know, un- ends up being a three-time premiership captain, unbelievable player, went from winning... You know, a Brownlow, albeit not his, um, <laughs> oh, uh, but winning BNFs and everything else and, you know, having 30, 35 possessions to a 20, 25, but just a, just a combative captain-style game. Those two in particular, and I know it's been spoken about a lot, but, um, you know, the, the, the transformation, incredible. Trent actually stood up in front of the group the first day um, we got back and – it was probably the start of the vulnerability piece at Richmond, which became really big through that through that period and, and the DNA of that team. But he stood up at about talking about him him as a captain and him as a person, and um, wasn't he, what he hasn't liked about his game and what he wants to be, and um, and about giving back to the team. And it was a I thought it was a real catalyst for the season at the time. It's, it was very unusual for someone to do do that. It's more you see more vulnerability now, and it's more common in in you know, AFL sport now. But um, back then, no one really did that. I'd never seen um, a player, let alone a captain, do something like that in front of a group and show his warts. So uh, firstly, I was taking back and, oh, this is interesting. And then to watch him put it in place. And, and basically what it meant is, and maybe the club didn't set him up to succeed either because, you know, trying to get Trent 25, 30 possessions a game by running around the back. And, th- and maybe he felt like a bit of a, a fraud himself, thinking, well, I don't feel like I'm helping by doing that. Um, if I get 19 or 20 and late, 10 tackles and give the ball out, I, I'm probably better value. And I think that's what he was trying to say. And and he be, just became that player and he was happy to do that. And and it was a great lesson for everybody that you don't have to 
do everything or be everything. He was a wonderful leader and knew what he needed to do out there and um, yeah, and become a great of the game. 2017 was also one of the great individual years we've maybe seen from from anyone in recent times in terms of Dusty and he, you know, he spent his time forward and and, and mid and you you like to seem like you like to isolate him at different times. How much coaching would you do with a player like Dustin in terms of how he went about his game versus uh, natural talent and ability that he might have had? Well, there were some things we sort of fell upon. Um, like, for instance, Dustin, it's like Batman and Robbins. He got Dustin and he got Kane Lambert. And Kane used to always just work around Dusty. And Dusty would do a stoppage in the front half and then he'd just drift, slowly drift forward. And if he was sprinting forward, Kane would sprint up. If he's walking forward, Kane would sort of walk. They were, he was always watching Dusty and covering for his moves and seeing what he was doing to make sure we always had structure in certain areas. But we also had our best player in the spots we needed him to be. So... Um, yeah, so that that little um, maneuver and move is still move, used nowadays through through teams. But that little duo they had that was that was a wonderful synergy for us. And t- t- truth be known, we didn't know at times what was going on. Um, you know, because w- w- we just had to leave it up to them to sort of work out, which made us hard to scout as well. Because when your own coach's box isn't sure, are they holding? Is he dusty up? Is Kane? And they eventually they go. Oh, no, they've got it. They've worked it out. And they would, so we didn't have to send out messages because they they worked it out after a period of time. Um, so yeah, it was uh, that was yeah, and that, that's I think any premiership team, um, you know, you've got to have the little parts that actually work for you, and that that was a bit of a signature of that team. Before we we go on to, to Collingwood and more recent times, we've, we've sort of skipped over your time as a senior coach. But I'm interested, Leopard, now that you've been. Thank at, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested now though that you, you'd be pleased. With that. <laughs> you've been at several clubs and you've seen success as a player and as a coach how um different you are now or how many how you view, might have viewed yourself then versus the way you view yourself now as a coach and and and, the, and your evolution then to to now in terms of what you you know produce to your players um i guess any any time you go through hardships that's the greatest learning so it's the greatest thing to reflect on and you should always reflect on yourself first and foremost, um, which I've done. And and what I've been able to learn as a coach, um, and I was, I was actually going through um, at Collingwood when I uh, started there, our psych asked me, went for a walk, she says, what, what's the main thing you've learned in your time at coaching? I said, well, when I first started, it was, Lepi, you've got to have a philosophy. What's your philosophy on this? What are you going to do about that? What are you going to – and it just kept going on, and, you, and, you, and that's fine. You do have to have your philosophies. But if someone had to just grab me and said, you know what – just get to know the person and coach them the way they want to be coached. That's it. If someone had to just give me that advice from the start, I would have been a hundred times better coach. Because you end up creating a philosophy, and, and you may not agree with it, or you go hard on something. Well, that player doesn't play that particular way, so you got to you got to mold to them as much as they mold to you. So I was probably, if anything, going. Now this is the way you've got to play. This is the way you've got to win. This is the way you've got to train. All those sorts of things where I think that's what leads to people then not being themselves or playing the way they want to play or all, all those sorts of things. The other part of that is I had the youngest team in the competition with, you know, I think the last year definitely had the worst injury rate and all those sorts of things add up to not, you're not going to be near the top of the ladder when that's happening either. So choose wisely is a good one because uh, <laughs> um, you've got to have support around you there to help to get you through. And um, so, yeah, so those two things, the two things I took out of it. Um, if you ever do it again, make sure you've got the right, you know, support around you, the right list that you can you can help and contribute. I think I'm a good development coach, but I think I'm pretty good. I'm probably a better coach when I've got some pieces to work with um, than just giving me a young team to because I'm a bit, a bit more impatient than most other coaches. So then wait and hold and hold. It probably doesn't suit my personality as a coach. It's more I'm a bit more dynamic and a bit more strategic and like to. Um, yeah, just, you know, just it, it, it's it's a great point you make because that's uh, not only has the game changed, but the evolution of coaching clearly is, is a massive, and that's why you know when you look at you know even Johnny Longmire at Sydney, who you know has got a little bit of that old school coach by Pagan, and then you've got Clark. Clark owes a, a massive watch this space because mm. he is old school, he is hard lined, and then you look at the new coach, the McCrays of the world, and Uze's just got his job, but these young coaches that put their trust back into you and 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 the, the relationship's completely different. I mean, that's the main ever – Nathan Buckley, a great example of the first, I don't know how many years he coached, and then he changed his ways in 18 and he gets to a grand final, sort of morphs back into a little bit of what he'd done prior and and you look at what McRae's done now. That That is the – I think that's the biggest evolution in that job 
that we've seen in the history of the game. Yeah, people want their own space. They, yeah. they well, you employed me to be centre forward or full back. I, I've got to do the job as well. So and I'm you, a happy go lucky guy, and I like yep. laughing before a game. I don't have to be serious. Yep. So all of those little little things. You remember when I started? Like, because you know, you think about it with Robert Walsh. You, you, <laughs> you, you, you literally got them three nights a week. Players, people were still working. Like, you only had three nights a week. You couldn't really have enough time to implement strategy. There was no behind the goals vision. What are you going to coach them? You're going to coach them. You're not serious unless you tuck your shirt in, mate. Pull your socks up. So that's that's really your KPIs back then. Is is what we call nowadays pretty dumb stuff like that. Like that's really what um, all they could do because it provided. Um, this is at least you're being serious. No no talking on the bus on the way to the games. And I remember that saying, God, I hated footy. Like <laughs> it wasn't any fun. Or as nowadays that part's gone from the player, and we don't use it as an assessment tool um, whether they do that or, or don't. So you, you've you obviously um, moved on to Collingwood now, but you have. You did have a, a little break in there, and I think you'd, you'd spoken previously about the the balance that coaches face in their life. Have there been times where, well, I've, I think you said that you you didn't you didn't love footy, and and I find that funny now seeing you from the outside and and how it looks like you're loving footy again. How how, how tough was it at the end of was it end of twenty that you you left Richmond? Yeah. Uh, was that was that a product of hub and needing to, needing a, a change, or how did that sort of play it in your in your work life balance? Yeah, I think so. Um... It, it was a very difficult time for footy clubs. Um, so post the hub, uh, everyone knows the soft cap went down 33%. It hasn't gone back much up since then. Um, everyone else is getting paid. Uh, but the, the the one thing about that is that pe- coaches like myself are left with a choice. Now, I'd been at Richmond um, four years, and, and I think you always got to keep thinking, when is my time up at a footy club? And, it, and I don't think it was then, but it probably wasn't that far away. Um and they had to make cuts. They had to do. You know, there's a lot of young coaches with careers, and then I think you know what? That it, it's I'm probably okay to with all this to say. You know what? I'm, I'll put my hand up here. I reckon I've given them four years. They, you know, the guys know my coaching. That I think players have to keep evolving and getting new coaches around them to give them new little tools. Um, so it was just good timing, I think, um, more than anything. Um, did some great. They went out there, coached my um, daughter's football team, coached the local team. We worked with Wayne and Channel Seven for a bit. Did some SEN and met, uh, the beauty about that, is I met, I guess, the media part of the world, which I sort of probably had disdain for, really, up until that point. Um, not disdain, but I always thought they were against you. Um, but knowing that, you, you see, you know, Sam had been running around. He's just trying to scratch around to entertain us and get us a story. He's not really, he's not doing something to go. I'm going to stick it up. You know, you know this guy today. Or they don't run around and. I used to think they used to think like that, but um, it wasn't the case. Um, they're, they're just there trying to do their jobs. Um, and look at times, coarsely, they, they go over the top, um, report the wrong things, and the, there's a battle to get the news story out there. But at least I saw a human side to that part of the business, which I hadn't seen before. So that gets, from that point, it's given me a different perspective on people in the media as well and their role and what they're trying to achieve. So, yeah, and then, and then look, let's be honest, the, the only reason I ended up back in footy was through Craig McRae. And, you know, I helped him sort of get the job, but he said, I want you to come back. And I think Dan had locked us down for, for about the 15th time. And I, I probably didn't have a lot of faith in what was going on in the world. And I thought I probably should take this job because who knows what's going to happen. We could be in lockdown for the next 50 years away we go. Um, so there was a bit of that timing as well is why I ended up back into it. It's almost a level of, of fate there for you in, in that regard. Yeah. Then and, and then you've obviously, you've been part of the success at Collingwood. There was, we, we knew the talent was there at Collingwood, but they They'd finished, you know, seventeenth in in with Bucks. How quickly did you think you could get this group with Craig back to where you wanted it to be? And then the last two years, obviously, you know, nearly making the granny last year, and and then having the success this year. Did you always think that was possible, or has this group almost exceeded what you, you initially set out to do? Uh, probably exceeded. I'd, when you grab a team that's seventeenth, you don't think you're going to make a prelim the following year, and um, and then there, there's more questions to ask. Even then, was it a fluke? A lot of close games, all those sorts of things. So to, to go again, I definitely didn't think um, that was going to happen. I think I think the greatest challenge was going to be, and, and this is a bit of background talk, but Collingwood probably went from a slower game style, um, kick mark game style, running about 120 odd meters a minute. And this game style gets to about 140. So it, it, it was a pre-season challenge. It was a game styling challenge. And it's how quickly they can adapt to the faster running game style. And you don't know that um, when you go through it. You know what's going to happen. There's going to be some players fall out um, because that might have actually liked the old style. It suits that a bit more is not going to suit this style. We're, we're probably lucky we had enough players that that were suited it and liked it and wanted to play it. And I think that that's the most important part. You're lucky? 
or or just bloody good at winning close games, the Pies? Uh, well, we, we've trained it more, and, and that's the one thing that uh, my Craig's been my best mate for 30 years, and um, we, you know, we've got the, from 1995 there at the Brisbane Bears back in the bad old Bears days, but. He, the one part of his coaching I didn't expect him to want to put more hours into is the scenario-based stuff. He's going to do, you know, late game, in front. Um, and we had that at Richmond as well. Um, so we had the if we're in front, if we're behind stuff. But it was almost, okay, Remember, just remember if it's close again on a walkthrough, what's the setup? And that, that's really it. We didn't spend any hours on the track with it. We just kept to make sure every week or two we, we just kept it refreshed so the players remembered it. But um, maybe there was a part of the problem because we kept – I think half the time we should have won by 30 points in some of these games and we put take the foot off, it gets close again. And then um, Richmond were probably, when we were there, a bit more clinical in finishing games, whereas we, we weren't as good at doing that. So yeah. good or, good and bad. But um, in the end, it was helpful. Um, clearly three close finals. And um, I think the I think the public now see it and what it looks like late in games when we need to strangle a game and, and you know, the ball doesn't move too far off the field and it stays in that same position. It, it probably has changed the game a little bit. So don't worry, if you're Sam Mitchell right now and you're bottom the ladder, do you reckon scenarios is the first thing you're thinking about? You're probably not. You're just hoping to get into that scenario enough. you know. So it is something you do with a bit more of a mature team. I've mentioned this a couple of times uh, during the year and all my Collingwood uh, friends out there. That, um, I, I think I tipped against Collingwood 30 times this year, by the way. You won all 30 <laughs> games that I tipped against you. So uh, keep um, they, they should be uh, thanking me. But it's it, quite remarkable when you think about it. McStay... Um, who didn't play a lot of the year anyway, mm. um, new to the club, played a really good final, um, you know, gets injured, doesn't play in the granny. Your number one forward is Myacek and you win a, and you win a, a, a premiership with him being your number one forward all year. It, it, it is a remarkable story. I, I don't think, um, you know, you go back to your three premierships and you've got mm. uh, Alistair Lynch, Jonathan Brown and Bradshaw are all, in yeah. your, all in your forward line and that's not including... Akamanis floating there and others floating, you know, through the through that four line as well. So, it it, it is an unbelievable story that pre- this premiership. Yeah, it is, and um, and what it just shows is key forwards aren't worth much, really, are they? Trying to count out. No, <laughs> I reckon you'd pay a fair bit for oh, one. Oh yeah, no, actually, you would if they well, on the market. Well, you you paid a lot for, you know, not so good a one. But anyway. <laughs> Hang on. I thought well, that was the truth here. Well, yeah, well, no, I'm <laughs> yeah. saying Mc, Mc, McStay, it wasn't. He's not, oh, a, no, it, he's not a, 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 a massive possession. Paid a lot for a guy, and you, you're going to get it. Actually, it actually wasn't a lot of money in the end. And that's probably the bit that. The, 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 the mis- perception? The perception yeah. is that it wasn't a lot of. And now that the, right. the cap's going up to where it's going, and what people have paid Key Forge a long period of time was actually quite reasonable, to be honest. But. It's funny when you go through the list my management part of the game, you know how hard it is to find a, a gun key forward. There's, there's probably only 12 in the comp. And Geelong's had two of them for about the last five years. But like you, you, those big, tall, strong, clunking forwards, there, there isn't as many. There used to be at least no. one in every team, maybe yep. two back when we played. It's just, it's just harder to find. And it's harder game for a key forward now with numbers rolling back behind. You would have hate playing now, Wayne. It, actually, the amount of suspensions you'd have from the inbox oh. and the I'm whacking oh, no, in the head, getting allowed, in the way. We're allowed to attack the footy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it brings up another point and, and a point that I made earlier in the year and your great coach, Lee Matthews, uh, backed over last week. Hugel Hagen, right now, if you if he became available, would he be the first player that you would, you would Collingwood would uh, go and approach, given his age and, and what the upside and what you saw a little bit of this year? Um, look, You'd be an idiot if you wouldn't have a kid like that on your radar because yeah. he's a superstar. Like he, he, and he already he's shown signs. Um, like he played on Darcy Moore and and you know for periods of that game made a, a player as good as Darcy struggle. You know, so you see those glimpses and that's all you're looking for, young players, is they don't have to dominate. Yeah, well he can do things that other players can't do, and he's clearly in that category. And as I said, when you've only got 10, 15 of the of those potential in the game, of course they become valuable, and even more valuable, but. The hardest part's getting them. Well, that, that's the, I mean, you, you, you get a kid, you look after them, you keep them entrenched. They, they rarely move clubs, particularly those because, um, yeah, because it's it's so hard to get. You obviously had all of these close finals, and it almost became this sort of self fulfilling prophecy around you guys winning those games. I, I'm interested in the the balance with the players in terms of keeping them in line at times, because I know you said you want the players to be themselves, and they've got this confidence in themselves. Uh, in terms of the roles that they were going to play. But when you 
you're giving sides a chance in, in different games. How do you deliver that message in terms of doing what we want to do and still having the confidence that we're good enough that, that we're going to get it right when it matters? Yeah, it's, it's funny because a lot of our um, – if you talk about consistency of things we might have spoken about this year, de- defensively we're pretty good. Our guys really bought into our system and how we play. O- often at times it was offensively. Like you play Melbourne, you, you don't want to kick the ball down the line to go on. So you, you, like every team would go on with a plan not do that and you spend a whole quarter doing it because the pressure of the situation, you don't want to turn the ball over, you don't want to back yourself in. So it's actually a confidence thing is sometimes why you're not playing as well because you, you're worried about the potential result of – of doing something. So the plan's there, but they've got to have the confidence also to to execute the plan. And sometimes the safest thing, as we know, I just kick the ball down the line, get out of my area. Well, Max is just going to keep marking it and sending it sending it back as well. So, um, yeah, they force you into those particular errors. But um, other than that, look, we don't have – we don't get upset with skill errors. And people say, why not? Because you, you put a system in place or a defensive system in place, for instance, that enables the players to make mistakes. So if they make a mistake, you've got a system there that'll protect you. So we always just say to the boys, well, just invest in the system because the system's there to look after you. So you can make a blue. Because if you, if you make a blue and lose the ball and look up, we've got defence in place. They can't go anywhere with it. So you're always trying to lean on them and sell them those messages of backing in the team system and it'll look after you. And those times it did for us. You see a lot of messy ball. We'd make an error. They'd look up. The opposition would kick it, and Darcy would mark it. We got good, you know. So, so for, for them, it was just keeping them confidence in how we play and reassuring them. And people forget. Uh, Lisa call it dripping tap of coaching. It's, it's like a dripping tap. If if you forget for a week or for two, you, that you're just slipping and evolving. It's like okay, we've done this hard for two weeks. Geez, we're defending well, and then we stop moving the ball well. Well, when was the last time we've really focused on it? It's been three weeks. Ooh. You know what? So you just you're just sliding what you're doing. It's not changing, but you're always just sliding your focus. Um, yeah, because we can't remember all parts of it all the time. And fast forward to to grand final, then uh, players. You know, obviously they've got to have a life outside of footy. But it was, as someone even just you know I'm playing local footy, I, I I wouldn't do much the night before a game. Not really my style. But I, I just wonder what you thought when you when you heard about Jack. Uh, Ginnivan going to the races on a Friday night at Mooney Valley. <laughs> My first thought is, did he win the quaddy? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, if he didn't, it's no good. Uh, look, I, I, so, well, Jack, Jack's always a topic of conversation. And then yeah. I, I always say the same thing, that these kids are growing up in front of our eyes. He's a 19-year-old kid. He's going to make a lot of blues. And he's made another one. Um, when I spoke to Jack this year, I said, oh, I don't feel for you, mate. When I was 19, I was playing for the Brisbane Bears and I knew who I was. So I said, you can't go anywhere. And I said, and he said, yeah, I really wanted to go watch my sister play footy. I just, I didn't even end up going. Like, so he's putting up with things of his age and stopped going to things and because and, he didn't want to get hassled or, you know, whatever it is. So there, there's a lot on the other end as well that he's got to put up with that most 19-year-olds, maybe 20 now, don't have to put up with. But And then there's other things that he's got to learn and learn the hard way. So I don't. I'm not crooked him like it's the worst thing someone's ever done. Mm. Um, but it's, I think it's just a learning curve for him to kind of go, is this the best thing right now? And if that thing in the back of your mind's asking you that question, it's probably no. And so don't do it. And then that's probably the lesson out of these things. So what is your your role now, Leper? Because uh, I read in the paper the other day. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I read in the paper, but uh, well, it's it's always good to be wanted. Yeah. And, you know, stories about. So will your role change at the Pies next year and and and, and what will that role exactly be? Yeah, well, my job now is head of strategy. So pretty much running our offensive, defensive stuff, um, looking after our opposition and, and what the opposition guys are doing, our analytics and things like that. That that will stay there. Um, I guess I'm, I'm really what, – what it really means is I'm losing now my, the line focus. So I was coaching also the forwards this year on a game day. Um, that will go, and and now I can spend more time on the futuristic parts of what we do. Um, so I don't want to bore the listeners to death, but there's a lot of analytics taking over the game and how we make decisions and to get those things uh, a little bit more streamlined, particularly in the coach's box and things like that. Um, some of our um, projects we want to do, like within skill-based stuff as well, help out the those departments and also help coach our coaches as well. It's almost going from, um, you know, Fishing to teach a man to fish in some ways. Um, I'm getting closer to that. Yep. Um, so, yeah. So it's, it, the role itself, the, the name of it, I don't, I'm a bit funny with names. I don't like getting too yeah, yeah, fun, yeah, yeah. close into that. But it'd be more of a football performance type role, So, uh, which is awesome and which is something that the, the Bulldogs came with me at a bit, a bit earlier as well. 
So before we, uh, you've been so generous with your time there, but before we, we leave this year, this one more guy I wanted to ask about, and he's a guy who's been at Collingwood forever, but I saw a, a video of um, Pendles the other day really enjoying the celebrations. But it feels funny seeing him there because he's almost he's almost a whole lot older than all these guys, but just what is his influence on this whole group uh, and and his ability just to get up for, for every game? So we were talking about him the other day and, and where he sits in, in the sort of Collingwood you know, picture now. It, it's amazing what he's been able to do so consistently over a long period of time. Yeah, it's it's what an advantage to have a coach on the field. Um, it's I've never had the position, and I've I've actually coached a lot of really smart players. But um, you know, let's say something happened defensively, a breakdown on the field, or, or what have you, and, and and those that have played the game know it's very different the view on the field when you have got these players zinging past you, and there's you don't have the three sixty degree view like a coach's box does. That you're looking down onto it perfectly, you can see the gaps. It's like he's sitting in the coach's box because he'll, ca- he'll come to the break. He'll walk over and go, now, Taylor Adams on that one. Did you see what? Did you want him sort of more eight metres over there? Did you see how he – I'm like, I was just about to talk to him about that. He'd already seen it and assessed it and spoken to him. It's like, that's kind of next level stuff. It's like, wow, yeah. um, you don't – that level of coaching is like, well, I'll just go home then, Pendles. You just take over from here. So <laughs> yeah. uh, like, he will obviously be – uh, if he's not in coaching, he's got to be doing something in footy because he's – his brain's too good. I don't, I don't think the game will pay him enough to keep him there. That's half the problem. He's doing so well off the field. But um, yeah, what a yeah. I've never I've never experienced something like that. Sean Grigg at Richmond was very similar like that. I mean, any six foot one that could be a premiership ruckman, you've got to have some sort of smarts to you and work work it out and work out what to do and when to do it and when to jump, when to stay down. He had that level of summing up a game really really well. Um, but yeah, Pendles is amazing. I just finally. Uh I don't know if it's, it came as a shock to you, but we're in the middle of the trade period. Did, did, you, did you see the Taylor Adams stuff coming? And, and obviously a heart and soul player at Collingwood, but it now moved on. Did you see that, given his role, it, it maybe shifted from what he had originally? I don't, know, I don't think anything shocks me anymore. Um, you know, t- t- Taylor was an inside mid predominantly, and then he played predominantly half forward this year. And we always knew he had passions to go back in there. We bring Tom Mitchell, Mitchell who plays a lot of his minutes, and I thought he played the mainly half forward stuff really well with bits of inside mid. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think anything shocks me, to be perfectly honest. Um, so no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me. I'm, I'm actually right for him that he's got a club that's going to give him the opportunity that he wants because next year wasn't probably going to change at Collingwood. So um, he didn't want to leave. Like he's heart and soul Collingwood person, and and we love him. Um, but you know, sometimes this happens. Sometimes you're, you know, a part of the person that wants to go. And like you see your mates go other years, and now it's like Shit, this is me now. I'm the guy out. Like, um, so yeah, it happens as a player and as a coach, unfortunately. Well, Lepper, you've been so generous with your time, as we said. Uh, when we had Jacko on here a few weeks ago, there was a bit of banter between Duck and Jacko about oh, who oh. might have got who might have got the best of them. We never, we like I said, we never Is this played a, Jackson. St- no, no, <laughs> Glenn Jakovic. Oh uh, no, I wasn't not that old. <laughs> He's Mark Jackson. Um, no, we only played. We only we played on one of the bits and pieces here and yeah, there. Yeah, once I actually got you at Adelaide at the end when you were you just about. I think you were, might have signed the papers or ready to retire. Once, uh, once, once the, the the famous game, and and I think Dermot Brereton was giving out votes on Channel Nine. It's when Channel Nine had the footy coverage, and you were playing. He was playing centre half back. I was playing centre half forward. I kicked five. He kicked four. Dermy gave me three votes and gave him two votes. Jeez, I should have got the three, I reckon. Well, probably, given I was the four. <laughs> how does how does that happen? Were you just showing him no oh, respect? It was, it was actually, by the way, we won the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Oh, yeah, good. So, it was actually one, if if it wasn't North Melbourne versus Brisbane at Eddie Had, it probably one of the games of the century because um, Wayne kicked all these goals in the first half and I kicked mine in the second as well. So you, you're coming in five goals down, playing on him. Well, you, you're normally thinking I'm going to go a bit extra defensive. I kind of went the other way. Um, probably just shows how young and dumb I was at that point in time. But we were 40 points down at three-quarter time and um, yeah, we lost by three or something like that as this comeback in the last quarter. So it's actually a pretty cool game to be a part of. But I don't think we got Brownlow votes, though, that particular day. No, oh, that no unfortunately. That doesn't but surprise me. Like key was, position uh, players always go on no. about how hard done they are <laughs> uh, with the bloody, bloody awards. No, well, mate, you've done a – I'll tell you what you have become, before we let you go, you've become a little bit of the Midas touch uh, – mm. Now, yeah. I'm not uh, Neil Baum. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, no stretch saying. Uh, you've got the same size head. Neil, that's uh, <laughs> but he just everywhere Neil's gone, he's had to be a success. And yeah. just starting to, it's just starting to turn that way for you, which is, we're not starting to turn. It's been going that way for a while. So hopefully it uh, continues for you, mate. You're yes. Thanks for having me on, guys. Enjoyed it. Thank you.
Been a great chat. That is The True Thirts with Justin Lepich. You can either take the red pill, you'll wake up, everything was a dream. Or you can take the black pill, you can get torched. Well, I suppose getting torched won't hurt that much. I don't feel anything. Wait for it. Wait, I just got a new client. Get torched! Get, get, get torched! Get torched!